I think the purpose of this, I mean, or the frame of this conversation starts with something that Tabu or Susa, is Tabu in the house? Can I see? Ah, wonderful, yes. So Tabu said that the only way young East African musicians will secure distinctive identity is by embracing traditional music. Those are the words of Tabu Osusa, producer at Ketable Music. And it goes further to state that while South African and West African music is making waves on the international market, various initiatives are striving to cultivate uniquely East African sounds by bridging the gap between digital and analog as well as traditional music and contemporary sounds. This session is facilitated by me, but on set I have a guest, Kasiva Mutua, who's been quite an influential person in the development of percussion, especially for hybrid settings in East Africa. And uh, we'll definitely sample also some of the music that we've been making, and we'll also take some questions from all of you. I would like us to start with understanding exactly who we are. And no one can frame this for us better at this point in time than Kasiva, who's seated here with us. Because we have a bit of a crisis going on, whether it's identity crisis, whether it's a gender crisis, whether it's, you know, just things are moving in a direction that we are all trying to grapple with. And therefore, I'm inviting Kasiva, you know, to probably just tell us exactly what has been her journey in percussion. And I'll be back to sort of frame this conversation in an audio-visual way. Kasiva. Thank you. Um, so I'll just start uh, by giving you a short story of how I got to play percussion um, up to now. So um, my, my journey started when I was six years old, and I learned to play percussion from stories that my grandmother used to tell me. Um, so I started, you know, hearing different sounds from all the stories that she was telling me, and I would try and replicate those sounds on things that were around me, my, even my body, desks, plates, you know, and I started making rhythm from that. And that was back in the village, and I remember, you know, just being in that setting of um, music and, and at a very young age starting to see, you know, my space and the involvement of women especially in, 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 with percussion instruments. And, um, you know, I remember seeing not so, women, not so many women holding instruments. Um, that was left for the, the, the men, and, and women would dance, you know, and ululate and take part in everything else other than the instruments. And, you know, this just settled at the back of my head, and, you know, when we moved to the city, um, I started asking myself, you know, why, why is this happening? Why is it that I'm seeing women on TV, they are never holding the instruments? Why is it that I'm seeing um, women are just maybe probably just singing and not playing a titi or rutu, drums. And I shied away from, you know, sharing my, you know, the little gift that I had. And I felt a bit shy, you know, just coming out to play out in the open because I thought I would be criticized. Um, you know, and, you know, fast forward when I grew up and I couldn't control it anymore and I became a full-blown percussionist um, in this setting, I used to ask myself, so why am I really doing this? Why am I playing drums? And the fact that I'm playing drums in, in the city, in a modern setting, why am I doing this? And I discovered my heart really ached to reconnect to, back to the village, back to my roots, back to tradition, because that music was, it was very good, it was very intense, it, it felt like food to my soul. And then I started thinking, you know, how can I bring this traditional vibe or this traditional food that I was eating in the village into the city. So that is when I started thinking, how can I make percussion functional in the musical styles that we play here in Nairobi and in bigger cities? And so my journey started. It hasn't been easy. Um, you know, you have to really think hard of special elements and just trying to make um, an instrument behave in a certain way that it's not, used, it's not used to behaving. You know, you have sometimes to detune, you have to, if a certain rhythm is full, you have to shed a bit of the rhythm to sort of fit into that genre. Um, you have to keep experimenting. And I mean, it hasn't, it hasn't been received all very well. I mean, there are people who are very critical about the functionality of percussion in this kind of music because you know, if I go back to the village, 
I'll be told, you know, I'm disrespecting the drum. This is not the function of the drum. The drum has particular functions and in its own, in its own original setting. And, you know, you start thinking, well, is it really about disrespecting the culture or is it, you know, trying to bring this culture to the people who haven't been in the village, who haven't, like, who have been born in the city and raised in the city or visiting people who need to have a taste of this culture. So there's that gray area that I keep on dealing with. Um, and you know, if we, I have a question, yes. especially on your transition from mm. looking at the drum or the percussion as just a traditional instrument right. and actually creating a hybrid into the urban space, especially uh, where we've been working with, a, not as, I mean, DJs came later. Right on. But before then, there was a profusion. Mm. And it, was, it, is, it would be good for us to also reflect a little bit on that transition from traditional instruments and coming into a profusion and then also beyond, and what your journey has been about that. Right on. Um, with Afrofusion, it's easy, you know. It's, it's Afro fusing with... It's, Afrofusion is, is generally fusing a traditional instrument with a modern style of music. And that can be really easy. And, and you know, in, in spaces like this, I feel like the younger generation is very experimental with this kind of stuff. But, you know, when it comes to um, things like electronic music, it becomes a little bit difficult because, you know, sometimes it's hard to... Say like a drum, for example, it's hard to fuse that drum with a DJ and at the same time the DJ is thinking, well, you know, I could just sample this piece of, you know, this, this drum, I could sample some beats, process it into a sound that I relate to and then play with it. So it's, I feel like there's, there's a huge challenge in that area and I feel like it's something that we really, really need to address. So you could tell me as a DJ and somebody who has, um, has the experience of playing with percussionists and a percussionist yourself, how you deal with that? Well, basically, uh, it, it, goes, it, it goes back to the big conversation around what is the role of technology in what we're doing? And the role of technology, it could either be good or bad. If it kills live, you know, the live effect on live music, then I think that the use of technology in that instance is, is more negative than progressive. But then if then it makes it a progressive performance that is a hybrid in between what you know uh, DJs are doing and what percussionists are doing, I think there is value to that. So basically it's a very individual question. It's also the same question that people would ask what happens with music in the hands of DJs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and then maybe I would ask you, you know, um, what are some of the avenues that have really seen you be able to bring you know, these traditional sounds into the urban space. Uh, I'm definitely sure you've traveled, I'm definitely sure you've performed in quite, quite a number of forums and stuff like that. But what has that journey been? Well, it's been an interesting journey. Um, I feel very blessed to have traveled quite a lot to um, experiment and collaborate with musicians from a lot of places. And uh, over time, I've become very experimental and I've fallen in love with collaborative spaces. And um, some of these projects, like the Nile project, for example, is a, collaborate, uh, a, co a collaborative um, project that brings a number of musicians from uh, some of the countries from the Nile Basin to make music together. And you know, this challenges you know this challenges you because as a percussionist, I have to make my instrument behave in a manner that it's not. If I take my instrument and put it in an Egyptian setting, for example, it has to sound different, it has to behave in a different way. And I mean, that is prone to criticism back here, back home, and even amongst my fellow percussionists, like, what is she doing, you know? Um, I mean, there's avenues like uh, Coke Studio Africa that I have been part of that actually, that is a very, very good example because this is all about, you know, pop music. So I was, I was in South Africa like, um, I think a month ago, I was doing a collaborative uh, project courtesy of the British Council. Um, it was called X-Jazz, and X-Jazz brought uh, six female jazz musicians from um, the UK um, and Southern Africa to collaborate and make new music. 
And you know, I remember being, being very skeptical before I went because I thought I was gonna go there with uh, Luo traditional drums that are called Bunde or Rohangla drums. And I thought, how are these going to fit into this space? Because this was just throwing me into the deep end because you know, I'm, sometimes I will, I will openly say that I hide behind the drummer a little and try and fuse it in there, you know, secretly. But this time I was thrown on the deep end and I was told, you know, now you are the drummer slash percussionist and let's see what happens. So that was, that was very challenging, but it was also very exciting to just see how those drums sounded in that space and how the functionality of those drums in that particular music. And it ended up being very beautiful. We created a sound that I don't think I've ever heard. And I think I can't wait to share the music with you all. It's going to be online soon. Yeah. Yes. Does scarcity in one way contribute to originality? In the sense that whatever is immediately available to you is what actually ends up becoming your sound or your first experience with sound. Right on. But so to me, originality varies. Yeah. Um, Originality is affected by different things. I feel like there's different factors that affect originality. For example, what surrounds you will affect what you create. And what you create is original content still. So that is original to you. I, I feel also identity is, is a big factor when it comes to originality. If, say, you travel and get a different experience, say you go to Australia and you hear Australian music and it becomes a huge influence to, it becomes a huge influence to you. There's what you know and what you carry as say, what was your name again? Kabaka. As Kabaka, there's what you represent and what you have with you. And then Australia brings in this feed and you fuse those together or you get to, ex to exist in Australia in that musical space, what is created out of there is original content, and I feel it's, it's, you should call it, 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 should be, it should be born as original for you, because that is something new. It comes as a result of a fusion, but in the, at the end of it all, it is something new and it is something original. So that's how I relate with basically originality. My experience is to move in the stage, still make up a tear twice. Yeah. Yeah. Like Rudy, Nenda, Miji composed Tena, Kapote Atena. Yes, he is sound engineers, but Nenda places in Guinea, the sound is not as clear, and the guy is not in Kata Ju Kenya Nafanya. Now I think in it to come out, Umepitia Kenya, and near Rasafi Umepitia. And there's no institution to nurture that kind of skill. Yeah. And if it is, it's very expensive. Yeah. yeah. So I think, is um, Unezayona Kama Shidana, how would you address it? Okay. Yeah. Polisana. Um, I think these are problems that we go through as musicians. Ata Mimi, I've gone through the same, same patch of Shida Kidogo. And um, what I would say is this. I think the biggest challenge is for sound engineers to understand how to work with these instruments. Because I have had, I've, I have had um, an experience where we had to do sound check for three hours because a sound engineer didn't know how to mic anyatiti. Yeah? It's either an echo too, too many highs, too many lows. It loses its, its that original sound. Ambayo, when you play acoustically, you feel clearly this is anyatiti. So I feel like as, as, as a music scene or as an industry, we have to work together with sound engineers, with understanding how these instruments work. Maybe do workshops and panels to understand, you know, the, how, what, what, what these instruments are made of, so that even sound engineers can understand, you know, what to do with these instruments. Um, we also need to understand, you know, models of sound check and just understanding, we see unplug cable when, when you're playing. Kusabu, even us, we're to blame with these easy changamoto. Um, but I feel like as, as a scene, we're growing together and it is both our responsibilities as as musicians and sound providers to understand each other better. So I hope it akwa, I hope it akwa poa. This actually was meant for the managers before, but it also applies because everyone's talking money, making money. We seem to be looking at money alone as a, 
as a um, it's basically we are judging success based on, on, on money. So how do you, with your art, how do you balance between capturing your, your original inspiration, you know, against the pressures of the industry? The reason why I chose to fuse percussion in this music so that I can strike, basically hit two birds with one stone. Where can one learn to be a, 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 a Percussionist. Yes. Where can, do you like have a school and where is it located? Suppose I have a, maybe I have someone who is interested. Where can one learn to be one? I've been running a group of um, female percussionists called Motra and the first lot just finished their lessons so now we are recruiting a new group. So I'm really excited if anybody in the crowd wanted to take those lessons and take this journey. It's not easy. Going back to tradition, my question is for you. In Senegal, women um, are not allowed to be to drummers, which is crazy. Even if one of the biggest drummers in Africa, in West Africa, in Africa, who is Dudu Rose, who passed away a few years ago, did the revolution. He had like a orchestra of hundreds of women with drummers and they, they, they used to do amazing shows around Africa. But in Senegal, if you are just a woman like me and you want to do percussion, it's actually not possible. My question is, how do you do with that in Africa? Is it the same all around? How people react when they see you? And I said congratulations because you're doing something amazing. I think it's taken me almost 10 years to be able to crack the ceiling and be fully accepted as a percussionist. I don't like saying female percussionist because I feel like it puts me in a corner. But it's really tough. It's really tough culturally to approach the old men and say that, hey, I am here and I am serving you drums. I mean, over time, it's been fights and fights and fights. But it's weird because when you travel outside, that is where you're fully accepted. And I think it's because of um, here we're still culturally sort of locked into how we are still doing things, although this is greatly, greatly changing. And I think until I traveled outside and then I came back is when I was accepted fully. So it's, it's a journey. It's, it's something that I'm still doing. I am teaching um, little girls and you know, men alike to play percussion and just tell our stories using the drum as a tool of expression. My name is Tengol from Ghana. Uh, my first question goes to uh, her. I wanted to know, what has been uh, the reception uh, for your kind of music uh, across the African region? And uh, the second thing is I wanted to know, you just said something now uh, concerning how hard it is, you know, for you here until you get uh, out of the country uh, to the southern side and they accept it. And I want to know, has our media in African region failed us, you know, in terms of, you know, introducing our uh, kind of music to the audience? Has, is it, has it been the point? All our audience here, we have decided to not to love ourselves as Africans. Has that been the issue? I really echo with you, man. Like, I feel like we fail ourselves as a continent to actually accept, accept us offering us good things, you know? It's not an issue, you know? So I think we should just check with ourselves, just check with ourselves and see what is it we value. Is it the music? Or is it the aesthetic of this is the person presenting this music? At about 2011, there used to be a DJ in Nairobi called DJ Kotega. Many of you might remember him. This used to be largely a mix of electro and percussion type of music. That it's two musics playing in one space, but they don't necessarily have to create harmony. So it depends on what you're listening, whether you're listening to the DJ or whether you're listening to the percussionist. But we danced ourselves silly for like about two, three, four years, but the music still heavily remained to be Koito, Koduro, South African House, Afrobeat, and sometimes it would get a little bit funky and get into bongo flavor. But what you notice is the presence of percussion in all these types of, you know, all these engagements were heavily percussive, like the dance was driven more by the percussion than the DJs, but you know, that's arguable, but that was the reality of the time. What I put here today is just a snapshot of that this grew to beyond just music, to fashion and expression. Electro Freak grew to become a sort of uh, place where we went to discover our Africanness in the music, in the space. 
I'm looking at, this is the outfit called the Beat Parade Band. Magati is over there. I look at him, he's over there. I'm glad that he's in the house. And a few other musicians, so saxophone, percussion, and also body art started emerging as part of this kind of, you know, this kind of engagement. But then, at about 2012, end of there, you know, you see this poster that I put here connects Nairobi and New York City and Accra, Ghana, but also beyond that, DJ Kotega from Nairobi. So this is what is happening at this particular point in time, and we're actually all of us trying to discover that we are really sitting on a gold mine and cultivating maize. We are sitting on culture, it's our oil, it's our natural resource, and we're not just actually manipulating and producing this type of music for the urban space, and we could actually make money out of it. This realization led us to thinking around the idea of Santuri project, which started in Zanzibar uh, 2012. I think Yusuf might be somewhere here. Big up wherever you are. Thank you for making this happen. But the whole idea around this was to equip people with hardware, software, skills, collaborations, experimentation, to just be able to try out new things. But then we created the formats where we could harvest the samples. I know, brother, you're wondering about sound engineers. We've had projects that have tried to train some sound engineers, but be besides you know, just doing pop-up studios and doing pop-up spaces where we could record authentic East African sounds. Then in 2013, Sound Collective started being born. If I mention some of those, there used to be a party in Kampala called Hatari Voltage. Faisal, if he's here, he'd remember that. There used to be a Bakisimba percussion discussion at the National Theatre there for many days, every other Friday. Clang Collective, Bangatronics, and actually radio stations started to actually broadcast music that had a very Afrocentric feel to it. One of the shows was called Afrocentro on radio, on Homeboys Radio. And then there is uh, Jakrusta and uh, Cafe Mocha that happens every Sunday, still continues. But the emergence of birth, I mean, or the birth of sound collectives was quite an important aspect of this particular time. Come to 2014, and the pop-up culture starts to grow in East Africa. There were pop-up studios in Bayimba Festival, in, uh, if you go down into South Isabusara. But beyond that, we used to actually bring a lot more value onto the festival. So you'd have a sundowner session, you'd have an after party, and these were spaces where these sounds that we were recording or this music that was coming up from these makeshift studios was, was, was showcasing, uh, you know, whether before or after the festival or during the festival. And one of the people that I appreciate most is Faisal, because Bayimba really took wholeheartedly and assigned the second stage to experimental sounds. And that's where people got the opportunity to start fusing, you know, that these traditional sounds with the, uh, you know, these traditional sounds with urban, you know, urban pop music. Fast forward to 2015, Nyege Nyege becomes a phenomena in the area. This is a space where, you know, young guys can really, really express themselves. We start to see female DJs coming onto the electronic music movement. Campire, DJ Rachel are some of those uh, who've been quite ahead in this type of space. The whole idea around Afrofuturism and Wakandaism, if I would call it, like, you know, art becomes a little bit more abstract, abstract but it's informed by culture at the same time. Whether it's in terms of the sounds that are coming onto you know, onto, onto the festivals, but also in terms of fashion and dress. So it is a process of rediscovery and re-engagement. Come 2016, and we tried an idea around the East Africa music circuit. It really never took off as a project, but it actually happened to be in its own organic space, that artists were coming from Nairobi to Kenya, from Kenya to Tanzania to Zanzibar, and all these type of places, but taking with them their original sounds and you know, and textures that they were carrying from the different countries. But beyond that, there is the culture of reissuing music that big labels like Soundway have been coming back and digging music from the 70s and the 80s and actually releasing new stuff into the space. And anytime one of these albums comes out, we're always hit by a new wave of, you know, what are these sounds? How did we not know them? And one of my friends is here, Ashton Lawrence, was asking, where do you get this music from, you know? Where do you get music like this from? You know, you have to dig below the surface to actually kind of get it. Thank you, Mura, I hear you. But then again, uh, beyond that, you start to see, um, you know, new releases of part of music that has uh, these, these types of sound. And one of those is a collaboration between Macadam and an artist from the UK, uh, from South Africa, called Bear. 
and one of those tracks is called Nyako. I wish I had the time to play it, but we won't do that for now. Uh, but this track got into the UK charts and grew like really big in the Gilles Peterson show. And it was just a fusion between Macadam on the Nyatiti and a South African producer. And I can share it with you later if you'd like to do. But this culture has also influenced our own appreciation and how we've consumed music and how we've brought traditional sounds into the urban space. Fast forward into 2018. I know we would all like to listen to just that set, but coming of Boiler Room to Nairobi was one of the biggest mark of saying that East Africa is becoming into, I mean, is coming of age in terms of this ethno fusion. There is something unique that is happening here. Everybody is trying to look at what East Africa is producing and what East Africa is consuming. And for you to hear exactly what this has been, we've been working with a young DJ called DJ Mura. He's in the studio over there. And I would like him to sample a bit or a song that he picked from Macadam and sort of remixed and reworked it to fit the new generation. DJ Mura, this bit. <laughs> A Freeman nominee in the house. He lost it and then he came back and he was like, Greg, what should we do better? I was like, let's go back to the roots. Let's get something. But we shouldn't get lost in that whole journey. And I ended by saying that young East African musicians can and will secure a distinctive identity by embracing traditional sounds and rhythms in their music. Uh, my name's uh, Francis. I'm an artist and I have a movement of artists and usually we use downloaded beats from maybe US, UK, or Af the Afro beats from Nigeria or South Africa, because the people mostly from Eastlands, that's what we can access. But we really want to have the, the, the real, uh, like the instruments from Kenya, like our traditional instruments, our cultural instruments, because as we're just a voice, and I can relate with any instrument because music is the emotions, what you feel, and what you see around you. So how can we maybe have access to these uh, instruments from our land, motherland, and express it out there? Because as we, uh, the artists, we are so many of us, and we have content, but we don't have the instruments that will relate with us. Because if I listen to the hip hop instruments, I'll start maybe rapping like Lil Wayne or those guys. If I listen to the Nigerian instrument, I'll rap like those people from Nigeria. But if I listen to the instruments from here, I will create something new because we're innovative, we're creative, and we have this ability. At Santuri, we've tried this experiment, but I can tell you that it's not an easy one. We sampled three instruments. We sampled the zeze, we sampled the Bunde drums and we sampled their Dungo from Uganda. And those samples are available for free download on Ableton uh, online. However, there's quite a number of things that you have to take care about in this space. And one of those is about, you know, just basically copyright. And then in addition to that is also how do you, uh, you know, pay tribute to the people that produce those, uh, you know, those samples and how do we build those racks. So we got hit by the snack that we couldn't hack all that immediately in a way that we could be able to compensate communities. If, if, you, if, if the Kidem becomes from your community and we sample it, how do we honor that community out of that particular sample? And it goes back to the question that Kasiva also asked about, you know, what's going to kill percussionists is that DJs are going to make samples for themselves and then ignore the percussionists. Again, I'll go to the question about media. Really, uh, I think maybe Nigeria has been able to successfully blow its own horn in terms of media. That is not necessarily true for what is happening in Kenya. We are trying to circumvent these world situations by, you know, like uh, going around the circle. We have a policy that states that they should play 60% local content, but they don't do that. They actually get Nigerian content and play it as local content. 
So we have to circumvent that by disrupting the ecosystem. And that's why our space and our operation is built on DJs, it's built in the clubs, it's built on social media, it's built on podcasts, until one day when that will turn to become mainstream, and then now we will have taken over. It will, it's just a matter of time. Maybe three, four years if we have this conference, then we might be speaking from the mainstream space. Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate your time.